Hey everyone, I'm Adam and this is How Movies Get Made, featuring the brilliant cinematographer Will Turner, who I've gotten the pleasure to work with. Hello, Will. Hello. Thanks for being on. Thanks for taking the time. Thank you for having me. Yeah, of course. Uh, Will has shot many commercials, features, short films, etc. cetera. Uh, and one short film that I definitely want to talk to you about today is called A Date in 2025, directed by Ryan Turner. And this short film is available online, uh, on YouTube, has over 6 million views. First, we'll talk about how Will and director Ryan Turner pre-visualized their entire movie. Then Will analyzes his camera movement choices. And then we wrap it all up with some lessons we've learned from happy accidents on set. Wake up, Daniel. Wake up, Daniel. Seriously, wake your sleepy ass up, Daniel. You need to ask that girl out on a date, on a real date, none of that VRBS. If you don't spend time with another real human being soon, you're going to kill yourself. Just because you're a cell, Daniel, doesn't mean you need to live in one. To dive in on a date in 2025, you mentioned to me before we got started here that you had about a full month of pre-production. What yeah. motivated that? What Ryan ended up doing is he would go out and shoot the movie before we'd go shoot it. You know, he'd just go with a couple friends and, um, you know, just re they'd hold the script and he just had a little handy cam and he'd film it. And we ended up reshoot, like rewriting because it just wasn't working. The script just wasn't hmm. at a place it needed to be. You know, uh, you read something on paper and it's like, okay, this makes sense, this is good. And then you see someone act it out and it just doesn't, it, it, what's on paper doesn't translate to what's on screen. But that, that kind of just really elongated the process of pre-production. Um, you know, we had to scout for sci-fi locations. That's not the easiest thing to do. We're going kind of more classical sci-fi with, Everything's big and grand, um, and there's a few there's a few locations in LA, but it's tough, and you have to. Yeah. We we scouted a few places, like a few studios. It just didn't didn't click enough. It wasn't. It was like it was kind of more of that grunge mm. look, not the not the clean look. We were going more of a <clears throat> more of a clean style. Um, yeah, what's that location that that is the exterior? or maybe it's an interior, but it felt like he had gone from his room to this other place to go on the date. What is so, that location? It was amazing. That is, uh, I believe it's Emerson College. Oh, okay. Uh, in Hollywood, I think it's Emerson. Um, and they've, they've, I've actually, now that I've shot there, I've seen it in a few other, mm -hmm. a few other TV shows. Um, it's funny how you recognize that stuff like you do an actor, and once you start shooting a lot yeah. on LA. <laughs> Um, so that, and I think, I believe those were actually the dorms that you end up seeing. Like, I think they've got a bunch of dorms outside and it's this weird building in Hollywood that you never see. And then once you've been there, every time you drive by or, oh yeah, there it is again. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's next to the Netflix building. It's kind of right. over that. That's on sunset, I think. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's, I mean, it's a really cool design. It's, yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So you were adjusting your lighting plots and, and shot designs throughout this month of pre-production. Yeah. And also then with, we had a lot of constraints at our location. Um, so that took additional, yeah, I, I think we really, we had a look that we were trying to aim for a very glossy, mm -hmm. clean look. Um, but you know, you, we could really only kind of find that with angles. Then we found our location, and then we sort of started changing the lighting around. I didn't, mm -hmm. I didn't go into, um, I didn't really shot list with a lighting diagram earlier mm -hmm. on in this one. It was more because there was, there were too many other obstacles to kind of work around. Um, a lot of it just being logistics. This right. This, this had a certain problem. set of givens whether it's the location or the time constraints, and then you had to kind of make it work is what you're getting at. Yeah, and then so lighting, lighting, it's important, but it kind of took a bit of a back step 
to just, you know, trying to trying to film the angles on this guy, you know, a certain way. It's like we tried to find the soul of it. I think with the like the shot list, the soul of the shot list never changed. It was just like, okay, you know, this this entire scene is now gone. You know, the end like the ending kept changing. The ending was a big thing that kept changing. Well, it seemed like you had another constraint that. I, tell me about how this came about shooting at different frame rates. Yes. So the original purpose of doing this, we shot 48 frames a second, you know, the standards 24. Um, we wanted this to be t- output at 24. Um, but what I did is I shot HDRX on the red dragon, which allows you to shoot your standard just normal exposure and then it has a second exposure it shoots simultaneously i think we did ours three stops under mm-hmm. um and the, the the purpose of that was our location we were on i think the fifth floor down in the warehouse district like at some some artist loft um there's no balcony the windows are in the background of all the wides um and it wouldn't have been easy to bring that exposure down and wouldn't have been easy to bring our exposure up. So the goal was shoot HDRX, blend those two together. But if you do that at 24, um, the way that HDRX works, it uses your shutter speed to change that exposure. So it's shooting, mm. you know, your more open shutter. And then there's a, di- cause it's a digital shutter kind of, you end up getting just part of the exposure on the uh, what's called the X track, which is the, the darker track. Right. Um, so if you shoot that at, 20, at 24 frames, you have you have a lot of motion blur in your 24 frames standard track, and it doesn't it doesn't blend with your sharper shutter of your X track. So you've got like kind of those weird blurred lines, like your blurred edges, and and um, but if you 48 your shutter's a little bit quicker and it, it just, it's easier to blend. So the original idea was blend both of these, add a motion blur, convert it back to 24 frames a second. Hmm. So we end up getting this like very smooth, smooth, high dynamic range. Um, it also lifts your shadows quite a bit by doing that. Um, just the way that the blending sort of works. Um, Even though it, one of the versions is a little underexposed? Yeah, just the blending process just sort of like, it just, it gets very flat. Um, and it's different. It's very different looking. Um, you have to add a motion blur back on top of it or else it's, it looks too kind of choppy. Um, and what ended up happening is that, and I think this is a reason that a lot of DPs insist on LUTs in camera. They insist on a certain look in camera. Mm-hmm. It's not... It's not that you're looking to, um, you know, that's, you know, I've set this let, this has to be this way, no color corrections. No, this is, you want for the next few months when your director and your editor are looking at something, you kind of want to show them the intention. You want to show them the intended look so that when you go to color grade it, it doesn't go vastly different. Um, you know, if you're, if you're just, if you're not using any LUTs, you know, if you're just using like a normal Rec. 709, like you get used to that look. It's hard to then go mm-hmm. another direction, even if you intended that. And so um, they actually really ended up liking the look without the HDRX track. And then also when we got into post, we, um, we, we ran out of money, I think, to make every single shot a VFX shot because that, it turns into like it has to be VFX or your colorist is spending, you know, forever doing, doing multiple LinkedIn and, um, so I kind of got overruled on that one and they ended up, uh, we, you know, I was a part of the color grade, but yeah, we ended up getting over, which is fine. I, I ended up liking the look. Um, so but, you're saying you didn't end up applying that HDR blending as much in the finished product? We, we, it's not in there at all. Wow. So we, yeah. Um, so, so it's just see, a simple 48 to 24 conversion yeah. without any fancy stuff on top. Yeah. There's, yeah. We didn't change anything about it. So it kind of gives a different, 
but it doesn't look like just a faster shutter speed. Cause mm -hmm. that's something that, you know, a lot of people change your shutter speed for something a little more chaotic or a different look. Right. Shooting at 48 changes your shutter, but you're also, you know, you're still at a 180 shutter degree. You're still at a normal shutter. Um, so it, it's, it's still smoother. Mm. Um, it doesn't feel as juttery as a, as a 90 degree shutter would have been. Right, right. So some of the things you did plan for mechanistically did end up contributing to the final look. It's just you had to kind of manage those expectations maybe on the next one. Yeah. So that, yeah. It, but we definitely chose, so that was all the 48. And then the 24, um, as soon as he leaves his apartment, he goes outside, we're back to 24. We didn't, mm. we intentionally didn't continue that look. We wanted it to sort of feel a little bit more normal. So right. we kind of wanted something to feel off and then feel normal. Um, it came through, it worked, but yeah, we didn't use, we, the X track was never touched. Interesting. And it's yeah. interesting that you're talking about this, uh, you know, kind of intended uh, flattening of the, of the image uh, because this feels very Black Mirror, obviously, uh, a sci-fi dealing with the personal consequences of technology in the future, in the not too distant future. Yeah. Um, and in particular, the look, you know, kind of feels like that episode Nosedive that has a very pastel feeling like candy coated look um, that it seems like you and Seamus McGarvey, the director of photography on that episode, kind of both gravitated to uh, what influenced that those choices in the first place. Um, you know, we wanted we wanted a very clean look. You know, we wanted something that. I think it's, you know, it's the feeling of like, what, what kind of future are we trying to show? And I think it's something that, you know, corporations have kind of taken over, you know, everyone's life's a little bit simpler um, because it's like, you know, don't worry about it. The corporations will, will take care of it for you. The so, app will be your convenience. Yeah. Yeah. And I think with that comes um, like a smoother, more polished look um but you know if you look at if you look at the art direction it's you know we're still in like a building that feels old it just feels like everything was sort of you know we're not in like we had options of very clean clinical locations and we mm -hmm. we didn't choose that you know we chose like we chose something that looked like it was you know can just converted into like a modern housing i was really trying to go after um the outside world trying to make its way in mm. was also, that was the goal of the lighting. Um, and so the, and that's, that's why we were looking at doing the HDRX is, you know, I'm trying to, I was trying to preserve the outside world and just show some of that. So, um, you know, I just, ended, and the way we ended up lighting just turned it sort of into a big one side of the room had all the light, the other side, either it was just a natural bounce back or we had a negative fill. Um, but we really didn't, we did not do a lot of fill lighting. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, it's, we're kind of in a bit of a white box. Um, so, we, and it was very controlled. Uh, and we had, I think we were south facing, so we always kind of had the sun coming in. Um, so it wasn't, it wasn't too hard to light. Gotcha. Um, it was, yeah, it's almost like the practical uh, story motivation of uh, you know this this outside world creeping in more and more yeah worked well with a location that you're saying has kind of the sun always coming in but also is limited in where you can put lights and things like that um, so it and, seems like you were able to make that work nicely it, and part of that too is you know using soft light mm -hmm. you know we never there's no hard light and at any point really in his, um, uh, in, in his apartment. Um, yeah, we just, we just tried to keep a very soft illumination with a little bit of contrast going. Right. Uh, like the glow from a phone rather than something like extremely but, harsh coming in. Yeah. That, you know, we didn't want like that, just the sun beaming through a window. We didn't want beams of light. Um, yeah, it was, this one was really all about just, Staying very soft and very, um, I think. I think also too a lot of a lot of there's a lot of color tone matching. Mm. And we worked with with our art department to like. There's a lot of blue. Like almost everything is blue in this apartment. Yeah. Um, 
and you know, art art department really they really dictate the look of most things. Mm -hmm. um, you know, if you if you change your background, you change up art, total different look. What kind of influenced some of your camera movement choices? Um, a lot of that was just, we were trying to stay very, you know, very controlled, very fly on the wall. Uh, I kind of feel sometimes. You know, if you're handheld in the wrong scenario, mm -hmm. you the viewer feels like they're in the room. You know, they feel like they, they you can make a camera sometimes feel like you're a character. You know, like it, you know, you have to, you have to be very, very careful with how you do that. Right. Um, we tried to make it feel like like we we the audience are not in the room. He is alone, mm -hmm. um, and I think if I if I went handheld. You know, there, there's times, there's definitely times that, that we probably could have gotten away with it. Mm -hmm. um, but I didn't want to distract. I didn't want the camera work to ever distract from our, from our character and what he was doing. And, and, and I never want, I always wanted to feel like he is alone. And, you know, a solitary camera never feels like, you know, that there's someone with them. You know? Right, right. Uh, you don't identify with the subjectivity to the point where you're in the room with them. It's more of this objective look in. Yeah, like, you know, if I ever watch a movie and it's someone trying to hide in the woods or, you know, they're in a closet trying to hide or get somewhere trying to hide and there's a handheld camera, not always, but sometimes you feel like, oh, they're not alone anymore. Mm. And that could lead to, like, oh, someone's chasing them. Mm. Yeah, you don't want them to feel alone. But if, if the story is that they are alone and you're handheld, it's like, well, the only time you're handheld is when there's someone with you. Um, Interesting. Interesting. So it's, it's, it's a way that you can, you know, in, impose on the viewer how to feel is, is handheld or not. And I think we just wanted something that was the kind of flawless, smooth moves mm -hmm. because it should kind of, it's in the future. It should feel flawless match with you know all this everything is pristine in this house mm -hmm. there's not much but it's all pristine and i think um and then to go with that too uh it's definitely easier for vfx and the kind that we had here um you know i think that right. was a, that wasn't a major contributor to it but it was definitely like hey if you're gonna not go hands out it also makes vfx on like you know a little short film where we don't have a lot of money Mm -hmm. It'll help speed up that process. It'll make his life easier. Um, sometimes VFX, you know, it looks a little funky. If you always, you should always move the camera when you're doing VFX. Right. But you know, because if, it, if it's just on a tripod, that looks fake too. So you need to kind of move a little bit. Mm. But you don't. Um, you don't want to go so handheld that like the viewer has no idea what's happening. Um, right, unless you're doing a movie like uh, Cloverfield or something where the idea is to like kind of have this lurking thing in the background. But to your point, this film, A Day in 2025, is much more about we are looking in on this world that is not ours and it's yeah. a character that's not us, probably because of some of the morality tale aspects of it that, you know, we find out from watching the film, which you all should. What kind of discoveries and explorations did you get to have with Ryan and Sasha in, in the filming of this, this movie? There's one big master shot that we really kind of live mostly in. Mm -hmm. um, we had a ton of shots planned. We were running out of time that day. I think that was our last day at that location. Mm -hmm. um, and we set down this big dolly track and the, the intent was okay, we can shoot this angle from here and then we'll cut to this shot. And during that process, we'll move it to the next spot and just keep shooting. And they turned into this movie master that it was never intended to be, but it completely worked. Just, you know, getting a certain, uh, uh, just, you know, point A to B to C, mm -hmm. dur you know, during his speech. And it, it ends up working out really well. Um, Interesting. So the constraints of, what it was a three day shoot, right? Very impressive yeah. for three days to get this much, uh, this much coverage in general. And, and so you were just running out of time and you weren't planning on moving the master at first. We, we had a series of, we had like 10 shots and like an hour to get through those. Yeah. Um, so we just set a dolly track down where, okay, we're, you know, we'll take this shot and move it to here. We'll take that shot, and move it to there. Mm. And we'll just dolly between them. Um, and the dolly ended up, 
becoming the thing and it, it sort of evolved that way um you know very quick and it just it, you know you see a performance through the lens and you're like okay no you don't we don't need any other shot like that one worked um, yeah and it's cool for that moment too because he's about to break out of this box yeah so that seemed to and, work really well then we also had a bad a bad one that really affected the film okay. um so we go to the we go to uh, the college where we you know we do the outside exterior like the big sci-fi looking place. Um, we had a steady cam operator that day. Hmm. There's no steady cam shots in this film. Hmm. Um, so what happened is they have these huge lights that light up the entire um, exterior facade of of this college, and we're talking like twenty just massive lights. Um, I think they're HID lights, but I'm not sure. But they're we found out that they were on a timer and they went off at, it was like 1045 or like 1145. Like it wasn't the time that you would assume they'd go off mm -hmm. and no one ever, we never checked into like, right into any of that, I guess. Um, and the location never told us that the lights are on a timer. So we had shot everything else. The steady cam was the last shot of the day and we were going to take him from the bridge. Um, to to our actress like do one big smooth following you know leading like we'd rehearsed it um and then all those lights turned off and they wouldn't they wouldn't turn it back up. like you know we're already that's our last shot of the whole film that we're about to shoot and it just uh we didn't end up getting that so there was a little we didn't need it it wasn't necessary you know the story still told the same way but there's an you know we were ready to go and it like the camera was on the vest like he was ready to shoot we'd already rehearsed one wow we should have shot should have shot that rehearsal um mm. which i don't often like doing and i but, do so, and yeah when we shot together <laughs> we noticed that but yeah um but yeah so that that was a that was also an accident you know right and, but you didn't need it after all you know it, it you end up with no. a, a nice you know confined moment with the two of them yeah and I, and I wish we had more shots at that location that was very limited i kind of mm -hmm. it's you can point the camera any direction there it's and you can get some really cool stuff um i bet but it just turned into we could you know we had a company move to that spot we had four or five hours to do it all um and it it, it was about the two people meeting up and getting that moment right, right? it wasn't about anything else other than you know he shows up he looks at her and then you have to get them together so right um, you know, so you had to prioritize the other stuff first anyways yeah make sure those beats were captured but yeah yeah and we um and that was a that was a pretty decent lighting package that we had to use for that area you know we didn't mm. we didn't have the biggest budget we didn't have a ton of lights but um you know we had enough to to do what we needed to do there okay yeah. Well, sometimes that's how movies get made. So yeah. thanks for taking the time, Will, to talk about your process on, on all this. You can catch more of Will's work uh, on his website, turnercinematography.com, or on Instagram at turnercine. Thank you. Thanks. See you later.